Good morning and welcome. Our opening hymn this morning is America the Beautiful. A 
reading from the Acts of the Apostles. After Jesus had been taken up to heaven, the Apostles returned to Jerusalem from the Mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. When they entered the city, they went to the upper room where they were staying. Peter and John, James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. All these devoted themselves with one accord to prayer, together with some women, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.
A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Glory, Glory to you, Lord. Lord. Jesus raised his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Give glory to your Son, so that your Son may glorify you. Just as you gave him authority over all people, so that your Son may give eternal life to all you gave him. Now this is eternal life, that they should know you, the only true God, and the one whom you have sent, Jesus Christ. I glorified you on earth by accomplishing the work that you gave me to do. Now glorify me, Father, with the glory I had with you before this world began. I revealed your name to those whom you gave me out of the world. They belonged to you, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word, and so I pray for them. Now I will no longer be in the world, but they are in the world, while I am coming to you. The Gospel of the Lord. Before the sermon this morning, I just wanted to share something with you. Uh, this morning, Monsignor Georgia is celebrating the 45th anniversary of his ordination. And we all cherish John as a true and generous pastor, and the most loyal of friends. So I invite those of you at home to join me in expressing our congratulations and our love for this fine man. Back in 1945, the English writer Evelyn Waugh, who was well known for his comic novels and silly satires, wrote a very serious book about faith, specifically Roman Catholic faith. Waugh was himself a Catholic convert, and this novel, called Bride's Head Revisited, examines the lifelong struggle between the shining beauty of Catholic faith and the dark horror of old Catholic guilt. The central character is a middle-aged soldier in World War II who's trying to make sense of his life and his confused sexuality by sorting out his memories and searching for signs of God's love. So the setting of the story may seem to be the European war, but the real battlefield is in fact the human soul, the human conscience. At one point, the soldier writes this, my theme is memory. These memories are my life because we possess nothing certainly except the past. Now, we all want to know who we are, and instinctively we realize that the answer is somehow rooted in our past, in who we've been, in where we've come from. That's why we pepper our aging parents and grandparents with questions. Questions about their own lives, 
lives, about deceased relatives, about all the changes they've witnessed over the years. Because we want to save all the tiny jigsaw puzzles, big jigsaw pieces rather, of our family history. All the tantalizing clues that can solve the mystery of life. Memory is a treasure of accumulated wealth and sweetness. But memory can also be a source of stabbing sorrow. People who are afraid of any pain would argue that it's best to leave the past in the past. Why subject ourselves to old regrets and shameful recollections? Remember in Shakespeare's Scottish play, the tyrant Macbeth, in his tragic decline, begs his doctor for any medicine which will, as he puts it, pluck from the memory a rooted sorrow. Macbeth desperately needs a sweet antidote to all the bitter memories that are pressing so heavily on his heart. But in his anguish, Macbeth is forgetting the fact that every memory we lose hold of takes away with it some portion of our unique identity. To lose our memories would be to lose our very selves. And so we must always take the risk of remembering. But sometimes cherishing a memory misses the real point. This weekend, for example, we pause as a nation to remember our valiant dead all those men and women who died in war so that you and I might live in peace. And tomorrow, as usual on Memorial Day, we will hear several speakers say that these dead heroes live on in our memory. That seems a comforting thought. I often hear it in funeral eulogies. And recently on television, I also hear a new variation of that. People are currently saying of the deceased, may his or her memory be a blessing. Nevertheless, those optimistic desires fall far short of the astonishing truth. What Jesus has promised goes way beyond our best hopes and dreams. The dead do not live on because we remember them. Surely our memory of them is precious and consoling for us. But they live on quite independently of you and me. The risen Jesus shows us that death itself is an illusion, that there is no death. Life is everlasting. So the dead still live, period. For us to remember the dead is in fact to celebrate their continuing life, their enduring presence among us. That belief is at the very heart of our Christian worship. At his last supper, the Lord Jesus told his friends to do this in remembrance of me. That is, to use the struggles and the victories of his life as sort of a guide, a roadmap for the journey we're all making here and now. That's what we are doing here in this church at this very moment, and what you are sharing in your homes. Every Mass we celebrate is a collective act of remembering. 
a sacred and shared ritual in which we reenact the past suffering of our Savior. Each Mass recalls his passion and his pain. But if that, if that were all there was to the Mass, then it would surely be an ugly and unbearable memory. It would plunge us into the pain of the past and then just abandon us there. But of course, memory is only the start of a beautiful process. Jesus died to call attention to life. Jesus suffered to call attention to mercy. And Jesus endured hatred to call attention to love. We Christians remember the pain of the Lord because it points the way to our peace. But only if we can remember and understand. In memory, we probe the past so we can understand the present. We reach out to our beloved dead not just for their cherished lessons and example, but for their ongoing love, their daily guidance. They can tell us who we are. They can show us what to do. What begins with tender memory will continue with vigorous action. That's what our Catholic faith is all about. We remember the pain of the past so we can proclaim his peace to the present. I started this sermon with a British novelist. Let me close with an American, William Faulkner, who wrote, who wrote these wise words. The past is not over. It's not even past. Let us together profess our common faith. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only God, the Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, unsubstantial with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary, and then became man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried, and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and as his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I will go all the way to the resurrection of the dead. And the light of the world will come. Amen. Mindful of the needs of others, we lift our voices in prayer. For the church and this parish community, that we may devote ourselves to building up God's kingdom in our world today, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For an end to the COVID 19 pandemic across the globe, and for healing and consolation of all those who have been affected by the virus, we pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord 
worthy of our prayer. For those who have served our country in military service, especially those who have suffered the scars of battle and wounds of war, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all first responders, for health care professionals, and all who risk their own lives for the protection of others, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all who are ill and suffer in mind, body, and spirit, may God grant them healing, strength, and peace. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all who have died, especially those who died defending our freedom, may they follow Jesus, the risen Lord, into the kingdom of light and peace. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the prayers we now offer in the silence of our hearts. We pray to the Lord. Loving Father, hear the prayers of your people. Pour out your spirit of light and love to fill our hungry world. And this we pray, as all things, in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen.
always walk with us on the journey of life. Blessed indeed is your Son, present in our midst, when we are gathered by his love, and when as once for the disciples, so now for us, he opens the scriptures and breaks the bread. Therefore, Father most merciful, we ask that you send forth your Holy Spirit to sanctify these gifts of bread and wine, that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. On the day before he was to suffer, on the night of the Last Supper, he took bread and giving thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice and once more giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this all of you and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and everlasting covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me.
sons. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, from every evil, and grant us peace and happiness all the days of our lives. For it is in your mercy that we ask you now to keep us free from sin and protect us from all problems as we wait in joyful hope for the return of our brother, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, I leave you peace, and peace is my gift to you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and grant to us the peace and unity of your kingdom, where you live forever and ever. Amen. May the peace of the risen Lord be with you always. And with your spirit. Let us offer each other a sign of peace.
Let us all pray. <clears throat> Hear us, O God our Savior, and grant us confidence that through these sacred mysteries there will be accomplished in the body of the whole Church what has already come to pass in Christ her head, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you abundantly, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace, glorifying the Lord.